Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 44th edition in the Coffee Microcups morning meeting series. You're all very welcome. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. For anybody who's joining us for the first time this morning, and I know we've got a good few of our regulars with us, so welcome back to those, and thanks for joining us once again. I'm just quickly going to run through these slides, and then we're going to get straight into it with Sam and James from Ansarada, our first presenters. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, uh, the companies we generally have presenting on here are under 300 million in market cap, generally in revenue and approaching cash flow break even are indeed already profitable. We tend to not look at companies from the resources or the biotech sectors. Uh, it's what we call uh, industrial microcaps here, coffee microcaps, uh, and that can be you know microcap technology names, microcap. Uh, retailers, microcap industrial services or products businesses. Um, it's really just a catch-all for everything outside the resources and biotech sectors. Uh, structured this morning's webinar, as always, we have two companies presenting over the hour. Each company gets a 30-minute slot, which we roughly break down into 20 minutes presentation and 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box rather than the chat function. It just makes it easier for me to moderate the questions at the end. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So if you uh, have to duck out early or can't stay for one of the presentations, you can catch up on it tomorrow morning. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter, as I said, YouTube for the recording of this webinar and, and indeed all the previous webinars, uh, LinkedIn, and I also write a weekly subscription newsletter, which you can uh, access via the Substack newsletter platform. Uh, first up, we're going to hear in just a second from uh, Sam Riley and James Drake from Ansarada. And... After that, then we're going to have uh, Grant Deerlove, Executive Chairman of AFL Legal Group, joining us. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to hand over to Sam and James. I can see your screen now, Sam. Yeah, and if you just go into slideshow okay. mode, perfect. Great. Good morning, everyone. Well, video's off, but I'm sitting here with a coffee, uh, appropriately. I'm also uh, joined with, with James Drake, our CFO. We're, we're going to take you through what was a great year for us and talk about the growth that we delivered. And we'll, we'll get into how we delivered that growth and the strategies behind it and the expanded products that we have. And the third thing we'll, we'll then talk about is the outlook we have. So we're very confident in our outlook and we, we've got an expanded set of products and we delivered some strong growth. So I'll, I'll be walking you through that with James. So if you don't know Ansarada, we, we underpin all of the major uh, transactions that get done around the world, including insolvency and corporate recovery. You, you might remember the Virgin deal that got, that got done. That was a multi-billion dollar restructuring transaction. And the people that lead those things, they're you know, the, the best deal makers there are, and Vaughan Strawbridge, one of them, we're just putting in a quote to show you how relied upon we are in the capital markets uh, for getting critical outcomes. Uh, one of the things that we do at Ansarada is we're at the forefront of innovation. So in that deal, they are actually able to use our artificial intelligence, which can diagnose the behavior of bidders uh, to see how engaged they are and, and who's not, so that so that the people on the other side can, can make smart decisions and get a good outcome. So we built that up over having thousands of uh, deals under our belt and analyzing behavior patterns of tire kickers and the behavior patterns of the winners. So when, when anyone uses Ansarada, they've got all of that wisdom and intelligence working for them. Yeah, look, I've been running Ansarada for 15 years since startup. So we've found the lead company, um, you know, that we, we do do a lot of transactional work, but we are also relied upon by a huge base of companies for their always on activities. Government, I'll talk about a bit more. Like I said, we, we run a lot of capital markets transactions like IPOs, SPACs, M&A, 
uh, you know, we've got a lot of great technology and we operate in a huge TAMP. So the, the best thing to point out here is our customer growth. Every year since inception, we continue to grow our customer numbers, uh, regardless of the environment. Uh, so it was really, really good to see record customer growth. As you can see, there's a sharp uptick there. Yeah, this this page is all about, you know, I'm not going to talk you through everything today, guys. Uh, you can jump on the ASX and uh, have a look at this presentation in detail. But we do have a vision to help people be confident in making choices around their critical outcomes. So our software does five things. Those bullet points are all about improving efficiency through digitization of the workflow that people do, reducing risk with a lot of comprehensive security control, increased visibility across the organization and who's doing what, when and how, much faster execution and, and continually using AI to give people more insights and a single source of truth. So that, that's why people use our product. Um, that deals business we operate that we're a leader in is 1.4 billion. But the key thing to understand about Ansarada, the most unique thing, is that that business gives us thousands of potential new customers every month to expand into with our other services. So every deal connects us and exposes us to uh, thousands of more people to expand. And that's what we've been doing for years. That's why we keep growing. It's a very unique source of customers for us and it's highly efficient with, it's very profitable for us. Now, as we get to engage with a company like a CFO or CEO or uh, a general counsel or someone doing a deal, maybe raising capital, uh, over the course of that relationship, we identify what other pains they have with governing their information and security and collaboration. And there's always a lot, you know, companies uh, have a lot of pains to solve. But we diagnosed years ago that typically their governance, risk and compliance gaps that they have. That's why since uh, 2017, 18, we started building in a lot of governance products, uh, building in more compliance capability and more ability to manage risk in everyday operation. So deals come in, we capitalize on that, and we also then identify customers to expand into governance as well. So. Third column is all about our results, guys. We we uh, launched an e-com channel just over a year ago, and that that that's grown by seven hundred percent. Continues to grow. Uh, board products for governance grew over a hundred percent. We launched a workflow feature, which you can think of as like project management uh, type feature inside the product. Uh, that continues to grow. Our biggest competitors Excel and email. That's why we do those things. And Ansarada also is used for major infrastructure projects like uh, the Inland Rail project that's connecting um, Melbourne and Brisbane. Uh, hospital were constructed in Narrabeen, Sydney Light Rail, uh, Etihad Rail, multi-billion dollar rail project in the UAE. So our product gets used for major infrastructure and that business grew 30% as well. And the reason those uh, products and that network effect we have is important is it's global. There's over 460,000 users sitting in our product and, and they're based in 153 countries. So we're very set up to expand. Look, James is going to go into more detail on uh, some of these numbers for you, but just wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, we, we had record number of customer wins and subscribers. And particularly, we grew a lot in the second half. So the year for Ansarada was really uh, COVID affected in the first quarter last year. But then from that point on, we really started to layer on results. And uh, we did a merger and listing in December. We launched new products. And then in the fourth quarter, you know, that's where we experienced the, the most growth. So we have a lot of momentum going into FY22. Uh, you know, it's probably worth pointing out this deferred revenue column uh, for you that that that's where we build people, uh, but we recognize uh, revenue on a, a monthly basis. So people say in Q4 that signed up for Ansarada for, you know, say $20,000 in, um, in June on an annual agreement, we would we would recognize roughly, you know, 
20,000 divided by 12. So we may only have recognised $1,600 of that revenue in June, but the remainder is recognised over the following year. So we've got a growing bank and that was up 75%. So that's basically future revenue confidence that you can take away. Uh, gross margin for us was very, very healthy. It improved a little bit. And, and the exciting thing is we've delivered this growth while simultaneously increasing our efficiency. So we were profitable. Our cash flow from our operations was positive and there were some huge improvements there, particularly in the second half. So we're running the business very lean using the latest digital methods uh, to grow and that's producing more customers, but it's doing it more efficiently. A few highlights here. It's really the bottom row I'd point out as foundation, foundational things. Uh, you know, people are your greatest asset and our people are awesome and uh, we, we always benchmark ourselves to the best in the Great Place to Work awards. And for 11 consecutive years, we've now been in the top 50 great places to work on engagement and culture. Uh, so that's awesome. We, we, we did a listing in, in December and that was actually a merger and a listing. Uh, that, and it, there was a product set there from the dockyard, TDY, that we integrated. That was workflow. We were able to relaunch and integrate workflow and also the Ansarata board product, which is a very sticky product that's used by boards to run their, their meetings and all the activities around the board function. So that's another product we expand into and that got launched. And the top row is some of the numbers we were able to produce. We have a few products in our suite. I'm just going to walk you through a couple of them. The deals product I've spoken about, uh, it, we, we have 131,000 advisors that use our product regularly. So think lawyers, accounting, investment banking. So globally, you know, right now, those people are recommending and deploying Ansarada for a variety of corporate activity around the world. That's really increasing. So, you know, our deals products trusted there. Uh, some of the features you can uh, check out there. It's really known for its document management and the security controls we give people. That gives them a lot of confidence, along with an audit trail of every single activity. Yeah, I mentioned I mentioned tenders. This was uh, an example of the power of our network base and the deals engine. So years ago, KPMG were using us uh, for transactions, and they still do. And they they said, "Oh, you guys should speak to the Melbourne government because we're 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 consulting to them because they're going to franchise the operation." of their entire train and tram network. And that's a $20 billion tender to operate that, that infrastructure. And um, we think your product would be critical there. So, so we did, we, we won that tender ourselves and got involved and they used our platform to do it. Uh, and we discovered, yes, we've got some core functionality for tenders, but there's, there's these other processes that critical infrastructure delivery via a tender needs that we didn't have. So for the last three or four years, we've been building modules and features that power end-to-end -end management of a tender. And we've increasingly been growing that side of our business with a dedicated go-to-market team. So it's now a multi-million dollar part of our business and we're the world leader in, in being able to deliver that. And we've got nearly, nearly a trillion dollars of projects have come through our platform. So we're expanding globally here and the big number there, why we're doing that is, uh, well, one, we really, you know, we're proud to say, hey, see that light rail, see that new road network, see that new airport that ran on the answer out of the platform. We helped deliver that infrastructure on time, on budget. We, we kept the risks down. We helped everyone in the project be more efficient, but also it's a $4 trillion a year spend on infrastructure globally for the next 40 years. That's what's predicted around the world. So we, we want to be the platform that people rely on to deliver that with confidence. The last one I'll go quickly for you because I've spoken about it, but it is the board product. So you can imagine Anstrata gets involved with um, directors, CEOs, CFOs, and often they're managing a business, uh, you know, but they're interacting with the board and the board increasingly has a lot of responsibility 
around governance and compliance and risk. So our product gives board members not only a product to manage the board, but with our, with our other compliance and deals products uh, and, and the ability to have insight into the company, how are things being controlled? Uh, that's another reason people use the board. So we're seeing people bundle our board product in with other solutions. So the Queensland Department of Roads and Transport, they use our tender project, our tender product, but those tenders have a governance layer of committees and boards. They've added our board product on top. The law firms that use Ansarada, they are buying our board product because they've got sometimes over a hundred partners that meet in in a board, and they also have dozens of committees across the law firm law firm to coordinate. So we're bundling this in, and this is leading to a lot of growth as well. So with that that being said, I'm going to hand you over to James just to walk through some of the highlights in our numbers. Thanks, Sam. And morning, everybody. So everything Sam just ran through really under, underpins what we've done in financial year 21, which is really lay the foundations. Doing the merger, uh, standing up the e-commerce channel, uh, obviously running through COVID in, in, in Q1, we've really set up the foundations and we feel like we're in a very good place for growth. And that momentum has really played out in the second half, um, which I'll go through in a second with the customer number growth. And also, as Sam said, even though our revenue uh, grew 1% year over year, we were actually negative 9% at the December half year, and then 16% versus first half in the second half. Um, and where that customer growth has translated into the P&L, or into the balance sheet, I should say, is in that deferred revenue. Um, I know Sam just outlined how we spread uh, the revenue over the subscription term. Um, importantly, we receive the cash up front. But um, just, to, just to put a, a little bit of analogy, well, not analogy, how that works, 13.9 million will be recognized in financial year 22, even if we don't make another sale. So it's really around building up that recognized revenue um, and the deferred revenue corresponds with cash. So that's important as we, as we go to the next slide. Um, because you'll see here, we managed to increase our gross profit margin by 400 basis points year over year uh, and our adjusted EBITDA and the adjustments are just uh, mostly around the one-time transaction costs associated with the merger and the public listing. So they truly are one-time uh, costs. And that's why we, we're, we're reporting on adjusted EBITDA here, but you can see we expanded EBITDA margin by 700 basis points. And that translated at a ratio of 155% into adjusted cash from operations of 9.1 million. So foundationally, we set up so, so that we're in a good position to invest in growth and continue that momentum that we saw in the second half. Um, and this is just really highlighting where we where this, this margin increase and, and associated with what we did during the year, which was rebalance our cost base away from what we had to do in the last two or three years, which was really reinvest in building the platform, making sure that the, the products were ready and uh, it was ready for subscription and scale. But now we've refocused on top of funnel growth. So that free cash flow that we're able to generate uh, from this year will be reinvested in, in growth, uh, specifically marketing. To, and we invest in marketing on a, on a pretty disciplined payback metric so we can be confident in continued profitable growth. <clears throat> this one that really is a subscription page which, will, which outlines what happened during the year on, on our subscribers. Uh, so we have um, roughly 2,600 subscribers and as you can see in, uh, in the top left graph, we sequentially increased our net ads on a quarterly basis with Q4 being two, almost 300, uh, which uh, to our base active subscribers. We did that while ARPA remained our average revenue per account or per customer contract, relatively stable. Um, we are confident that that ARPA is gonna continue to increase. Um, and we'll return to above uh, year over year levels pretty shortly based on some of the pricing um, dynamics that we're seeing uh, through Q4 that will translate into ARPA given the uh, average nature of ARPA. Uh, on top right, this is one of our exciting stories. Um, we stood up the e-commerce channel as Sam mentioned, and it's now generating uh, close to 20% of our new ads 
uh, on a quarter on quarter basis. So this is a channel that we expect to continue to increase. Um, and it really is uh, one of the first thing times e-commerce virtual data rooms have been offered globally. So we're in a really good position there and there's plenty of opportunity. A lot of our cash flows are underpinned by receiving cash up front on our contracts. And that's even more so if you see that bottom right graph, given the concentration of our annual subscriptions, you can see that they're well over 50%, uh, which means on over 50% of our contracts we receive cash up front. And that's what's driving a lot of our profitability in cash flows. And that's back to you, Sam. Yeah, thanks, James. Well, yeah, look, the, the wrap up of where we position our products in the whole, you know, information governance space is three areas. So deals, you know, massive $1.4 billion market that um, deals can be cyclical, but they, they continue to grow in volume year on year. So if they have a dip, they come back a lot, lot, lot more. Uh, there's things driving that like um, debt is really cheap, organic growth is pretty hard. There's massive amounts of capital out there and there's continual consolidation in industry. So it's a really great area for us. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if it's good times or bad times. Ansarata gets used for insolvency and corporate recovery. You know, when we, we One of the fastest growth periods in our business was 2008 and nine. So the deals engine is great for us. Tenders, um, there's a massive pipeline of infrastructure development we're growing into there. And with uh, governance and risk and compliance, that's a $52 billion market that we're rapidly gaining more and more capability, more customers, more growth. And we get exposure to that market globally through our you know, 460,000 users that deal with governance, risk and compliance problems all day. <laughs> and they know and trust the answer out of brand. Here's a quick example, guys, of how we land and expand. Um, so, you know, you might have a CFO who's invited into the Ansarata product on the buy side of a transaction. So they're not paying us any money because they're on the other side of the fence, but they've got due diligence to do. They're thinking about buying a company. Uh, they find Ansarata through that. And then they, they, they're doing more of that activity and they have to integrate those assets into their business. So they expand into using our workflow module to run that. And then, you know, there's audits that they're doing and they discover they can do that on the platform, et cetera, et cetera. So I won't talk through the whole thing, but this is a great land and expand uh, what we do. And we've been doing this for years where we've acquired customers like, like Google use Ansarata for this uh, activity, you know, and they discovered us through this, this type of event. So increasingly we're getting better at creating more recurring revenue from our deals exposure. Our priorities are really simple. Uh, you know, they're, they're all around product-led growth. The product experience is everything. It connects us and exposes us to more people. But we want to extend the, the solutions for them beyond just deals into more risk, more compliance. And that's powered by a lot of digital methods. So personalizing the journey for them, uh, making it really simple, removing friction, uh, just like I showed you with that CFO example. We know they're a CFO on the buy side, so we, we know how to personalise the journey. And operationally, we're going to continue uh, scaling the digital acquisition channels. They're working great. Um, we internally will be orchestrating all of our systems and data and tools and processes so that we can, we can really leverage uh, you know, the growth and do it with high efficiency. And uh, as we said at IPO, we've been exploring um, M&A opportunities where there could be products that could complement the organic growth we're seeing. So, you know, there are some exciting things out there in, in the world of software, as you can imagine. And um, yeah, around the governance risk compliance space, uh, we're, we're continually reviewing those opportunities. So I'll hand over for uh, uh, questions. Uh, thanks, James. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, questions have been flying in here, so I'll try and get to as many of them as I can. Um, if what's the percentage of a annual recurring revenue from other products, um, other than the deal products? So maybe if we get a, a split of um, AIR across the the kind of three main products. I don't know if James wants to take that, or maybe Sam. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll jump in there. So um, in terms of uh, our revenue from deals, as in transactions, it's still um, a 90%. Uh, 
uh, with the remainder being uh, sort of tenders and, and board. Um, remember that we only launched Ansarada board in May. Um, even the workflow product uh, was launched in May. So you should expect to see that, that shift, but at the moment it's still 90%. Okay, great. Uh, and James, if you want to just quickly then, uh, this is kind of a follow-on question, a rough idea for pricing for the board product and the tender product? Sure. So on the pricing for board, um, the, 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 if it's a sold standalone, the way to think about it is roughly $100 per user per month. So if you think about um, uh, five to seven board members or users in a typical company, you're talking about $600 a month type size. Um, on tenders, tenders can range quite dramatically, um, sort of from sort of 20K up to, you know, seven figures. Uh, last year, we had an average of around 70,000 per contract, but um, that has been ticking up as some of the deals we're doing is getting bigger. Yeah, I can imagine the tender one is yeah, very linked to the size of the actual infrastructure project it's being used for. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And another thing to note, sorry, just one more thing there. Um, a lot of them are multi-year contracts uh, as well. So um, that's where some of our deferred revenue is. Uh, what were the reasons for the deferred revenue growth as well? Yeah. Um, somebody's saying here they've used Ansarada previously at a law firm. Um, great product. They want to know uh, how will Ansarada guard against the slowdown in M&A corporate activity space is, is one. And then the second question, do you have any thoughts about expanding into startups, SMEs, you know, employee share option plans, pre-seed, series A, or are you more squarely focused on mid and mid and large cap corporate transactions maybe sam that's maybe one for you yeah 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 okay so on the first question around any slowdown like um we we operate globally so rarely is that a global thing but even if it is we also operate in every single industry and and uh, i think uh, we wanted to highlight to people how answer others use for things like insolvency corporate reorganization um you know debt facilities uh all of those kind of activities that are kind of if there's a slowdown in corporate space that you know certain things slow down other things pick up we do all of them uh, so often if there's a slowdown too there's an increased level of um, scrutiny and and uh, demand from the board and and advisors and collaboration around what decisions people need to make and that's where our products used as well so immediately after COVID we saw a big spike in that the second one um, is we do we do offer our product for for free and um, we've got a, a freemium model where people can use our product for free until they have an event and we do have relationships with vcs and incubators where we we give our product to to them where they can put people on it early in their stage of growth so they series a activities small cap raises our product helps them color in the lines and you know concentrate on executing their strategy so the freemium and free trial method we have connects us to a lot of small companies and we we want to do that because we stay with them as they grow you know they get on and do a cap raise after the cap raise guess what you've got investors now you've got investors you're probably going to put together a board you're going to need the board product and then you're going to have to do a financial audit for the first time so yeah that's a great question it's part of our strategy to grow is connecting to them at scale Okay, and then uh, kind of we got two questions. Maybe I'll link them together. Um, churn across uh, the business, and then a question here: Are you charging enough for the deal product, given it represents such a small dollar amount of deal fees? Have you tested larger price rises? Yeah. Yes, uh, we we have we you know we've got all the data as you can expect. We don't just use it for AI. We use it to analyze um, the right fees, the right fee model. So, like I said, there's that freemium pricing where uh, often people are preparing for deals or they're preparing for activity, and and if it goes ahead, they're willing to commit to major expenses. But in the first period, they kind of you know don't want to commit to large spend. Uh, so. You know, that helps Ansara to get specified and used very early in people's life cycle of their business. Um, but when a deal is on, um, there's definitely scope for, um, you know, fees from all the parties that, 
reflect the value of what they're providing. And so we, we've done that and we've done a, a look at our pricing and we've made some adjustments there so that from the small Series A right up to multi, you know, billion dollar cross-border deals, we've optimised our pricing there. And I think James made reference to that in um, our average revenue per account is, um, is going up. And particularly we saw that in Q4 uh, and we're confident that that's going to continue throughout FY22. Okay, great. Guys, we're going to have to leave it there because I do know our next presenter is patiently waiting and we're going slightly over time. So if you could please stop sharing your screen and then we'll um, get Grant up next. Great. Thank you, Mark. And look, if anyone has any other questions, then investors at answerada.com. Yeah, perfect. Uh, we've had that slide up. So yeah, um, shoot through any to uh, James and Sam. Unfortunately, we didn't get to, I think, maybe one or two. But yeah, feel free to reach out. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, Grant, uh, if you want to start sharing your screen, I'll let you know when it's uh, coming up. How's that, Mark? Can you see that? Uh, I can't see anything at the minute, Grant. Uh, it doesn't. It hasn't uh, given me the little pop up to say that you're starting to share. Okay, I've got. Um... Let's try this. How's that? Yeah, now we're looking good. Perfect. Okay, you happy for me to start, Mark? Yeah, ready to go when you are, Grant. Yeah, thanks everyone and welcome to the Australian Family Lawyers Investor presentation for our listed company, AF Legal Group um, Limited. These are the results that we've put out to the market and were published on Monday. And I'm going to talk you through those and tell you a bit about us as a company and our journey, um, which has been one of significant growth from humble beginnings. Talk about how we've grown the business and, and exercise competitive advantages in a unique space, which is family law in this country. Um, I'll then spend some time going through our recent results and talk about the future such that if you were to invest in the company now, what you might see coming downstream in terms of growth for the investment and growth for the company. So a bit about us. Um, we have grown um, from humble beginnings on the kitchen table of the founder uh, in Melbourne in 2016 to be the largest specialised family law firm in Australia. We have 15 offices throughout the country, 80 plus employees. Our revenue growth on a um, compound annual growth rate has been 50%. And you'll hear this theme across the presentation. We've done this um, and we're the largest in the market, yet we have you know, less than 1% market share. So in terms of our growth trajectory from startup to the ASX in less than four years, um, we're the largest national family law firm in Australian history, which we achieved two years from our listing in 2019. Uh, we're the largest in the country. We are the only firm with significant capital backing. Our first raise to list was successful and our second in March this year was oversubscribed. And we have a market cap that's grown from $12 million to $40 million. Um, so we're currently the market leader uh, in the space of family law. So what is family law? Um, look, I'm sure everyone on this call will know someone or be familiar with someone at some point has consulted a family lawyer with regards to their relationships. So the startling aspects about the family law market is that Australians spend $1.1 billion per annum on family lawyers. It's the third largest legal spend uh, in the, uh, and segment in the country. It's about the same size as the personal injuries market where um, 
$1.2 million is spent. So it's a massive market. Uh, it, it, interestingly, it's driven by the fact that 50% of the legal relationships in this country fail. That's marriages and de facto relationships. And it's important to note that over the last three decades since the Family Law Act was enacted, the ability or the need for more people to secure family law services has been extended with, it started with married couples, then it moved to de facto couples, and then there were same-sex marriages um, from 2017. So it's a broadening area of services that are needed. Um, you'll see there on the slide that the number of divorces has remained consistent over the last 10 years at 50,000 plus. Um, that demonstrates it's a defensive play in that it's a consistently, um, it's a consistent market in terms of divorces. But in addition to that, there are a number of other services. There's in fact 19 service lines that family lawyers offer the public and they range from anything that includes um, children, property, adoption, surrogacy, domestic violence, relocation and arbitration, for instance. Um, the jurisdictions are very simple jurisdiction. There's only one act, one federal jurisdiction, one set of rules. So it's very easy to create a model across the jurisdiction so that you can operate or, or um, give the family law advice to someone in Western Australia when you're in Tasmania or from the Northern Territory to someone who's in South Australia. 95% um, of the cases um, that go to the family court uh, have lawyers representing them. So fundamentally, you cannot run a family law case unless there's a, a lawyer involved. So it's a, a massive market. It's, um, it's a, a growing market and there is consistently more demand for family lawyers in the current climate where you bring in dynamics such as COVID and self-isolation. Um, the family courts are closed. Uh, they've just introduced 52, sorry, 42 new registrars to deal with the demand. So it's a, it's a, a growing and solid area of the market. Um, one of the interesting aspects of it is the competitors. So it's a highly fragmented industry. It's full of cottage players. There are 18,700 law firms in this country um, and the average number of lawyers in those firms is only two lawyers. Family law firms are traditional, they sort of normally suburban practices, they don't have any capital backing, they work off old systems, antiquated software. Most of their work comes through word of mouth that they've built up over a long period of time. Because they get that word of mouth locally means that they don't expand or can't expand to other jurisdictions. And the scale of their businesses is, is small scale. They normally range from revenues of 200,000 to a million dollars uh, would would be the average sort of um, the average scope for a family law firm revenue. Um, so few grow beyond that scale. Um, most family or the best or biggest family law firms that I've seen cap out at about $4 million in revenue. And we achieved that number in our first uh, at the end of our second year of operations. Um, so it's a, it's a fragmented market. The industry is ripe for consolidation and disruption. Um, and it required the arrival of a national dominant player. And that's the space that we stepped into. So I just want to talk about our competitive advantage and how we've done this. Um, there's really three levels to it. Um, the first is that our client acquisition strategy uh, was disruptive. Um, I'll talk to that. Secondly, I'll talk about our business model uh, and how we operate and run family law cases. And lastly, I'll talk about our growth strategy um, that we've executed. So this slide sort of is a, a sort of a menagerie of various um, tech um, platforms and um, software opportunities that we engage in. So we arrived and started um, a, an aggressive attack in on the family law space online to secure digital retainers. Um, so we ran a series of algorithms to get our um, search engine optimization up organically. Uh, we discovered that 50% of Australians start their search for a family lawyer on their mobile phone. So we de designed a website that was conducive to downloads quickly on handheld devices. 
Um, we synthesized data from clients to create personalities and sent them out on social media platforms such as um, Facebook, where when someone clicks from being in a relationship to single, a banner ad for Australian family lawyers appears. Um, and from that beginning, uh, the work started to pour in as Australians really were searching for information about their relationship rights online. Uh, and we got ahead of the market and we've invested heavily in it. And that investments included a website that's compatible for digital lead conversion, both on handheld devices and on desktops. Uh, we have introduced Salesforce, which is the gold standard for customer relationship management software. So we can attribute leads where they're coming from, our return on marketing investment, cost per lead, cost per conversion, et cetera. Google Analytics can allow us to watch where our clients are searching for us and how far they travel to get to us. So we've opened offices and hubs in the knowledge that family law clients don't like to travel more than 15 kilometres to see a lawyer. Um, and we've really converted that through um, media buying in-house, internal sales team and call centre, such that the volume of inquiries are then converted into the lawyer's desk where they can assist the clients and convert them to ongoing leads. Um, no one had done this before to the level that we had. Um, and certainly we've augmented or strengthened it with a governance model that introduced a, uh, an independent director, Kevin Lynch, who worked with Unilever and currently works with the global private equity houses on their digital marketing strategy. And he sits on our board. So you'll see later in the presentation, some of the results that we've received in terms of um, inquiries and leads and file openings that have been generated. But we certainly got ahead of the market and it was a competitive advantage for us uh, and the way that we did it. Um, the second aspect is our model of how we operate in the law. So all of our staff have Surface Pro laptop computers so they can work flexibly from home and in the office. Um, all of our billing is outsourced to India um, so that all of the accounts management, debtors uh, and the drafting of bills and the setting of bills is done offshore. Um, we use, you know, all of the platforms that you can see on the screen there from sales uh, force to Google Analytics. Um, we don't have emails. We use Slack. Um, we use a national software um, practice management system called Lawmaster. Uh, DocuSign, every available technology that we can use, we use. Uh, we've now redesigned the modern office for a family law firm that will see the footprints of office, offices reduced by 30% in a modern layout in a world where people will work, you know, half the time in the office and half the time uh, from home in a flexible environment. So our model is conducive to ensuring that we secure the best margin we can in regards to the work that we do. Our third model is really our growth strategy and there's three hierarchies to our growth strategy. The first is organic growth, which I've just spoken to through our digital focus. The second is what we call lateral hires, which I'll talk to in this slide. And the third is acquisitions. So you can see here from 2015, I hope you can see my cursor on the screen, from 2015 to where we are today, um, we've grown to 15 offices. We're in every mainland capital uh, and we've created a number of innovations in the space. But if you start back in 2017, our Sydney office was open through a lateral hire and a lateral hire is we retain uh, and recruit in a senior family lawyer that has a following of matters and clients. They bring those clients with them. Uh, and then we overlay our digital marketing uh, on top of that lateral hire to turbocharge that practice. So it's a way of building a, a business immediately with um, work, um, no need to invest working capital, fees are billed within the first week. Uh, and so it becomes a cash generating and revenue generating office straight away. So in 2017, you'll see that we opened Sydney. That was a, a lateral hire. Um, February 2020, that was a lateral hire in Canberra. That office has grown from one lawyer to five lawyers currently. Um, we did a similar thing on the Sunshine Coast, I beg your pardon, uh, in June 2020, that was a lateral hire. 
August 2020 Adelaide, um, that was a lateral higher. Um, Perth uh, was a lateral higher in uh, November last year. Uh, and an extension of our Perth office to Joondalup was a lateral hire. So I just make mention of that because it's a great model to open offices without capital investment and risk of impairment. Uh, and then we can use our competitive advantage in digital to grow them, which is what we've done. People sort of refer to us as a roll-up. We're, we're, we're a roll-up business. We're not actually that. Um, we have acquired acquisitions and I'll, I'll talk to that and undertaken them but we're sort of blending our growth model across the hierarchy of organic growth, which is our competitive advantage and which is doing us well to this lateral higher model that we combine with our competitive advantage and then acquisitions. And our acquisitions up until recently have been small scale that just fit into our business. Um, but now we've got the ability to grow through, um, through larger acquisitions because our platform is strong and we've proven our model. So what we've achieved through IPO, our financial performance, I'll come to in a minute um, when we look at the financials, but we've had compound annual growth rate of EBIT of 125%. The new offices I've spoken to and taken you through those. Our lateral hire and acquisition strategy, our lateral hires, I've addressed some of them and there's been more in our capital cities. Um, in terms of acquisitions, it's probably best that I talk quickly about that now. So we look um, for income accretive acquisitions. Um, uh, we do not pay more than one to three times multiple, um, and all of them have been under the three times multiple. Um, the acquisitions are strategic in that they might be in a location, they might bring to the table something that we don't have in our operations or the strength of lawyers, or it might give us more scale in a larger market. So the strategy around it but the structure of how we undertake the acquisitions is key. So all of the larger acquisitions have had the equity of those firms rolled into ours by way of script. So all of the key players are locked in through ownership and skin in the game. They, um, they, uh, the acquisitions have them with earnouts, so they have to maintain a consistent revenue to their historics. Otherwise, they, they fall short of their earnout period. So a lot of the risk falls on them to perform in our model. And so we structure it so to mitigate any prospects that if, if they aren't successful, that there's any potential impairment or write-off. And then we work on integrating them and the people within our business. So it's not like we buy a whole lot of firms and cross our fingers and hope that um, you know, we can make it work. There's strategy and structure that sits behind it. Um, I've spoken about our marketing platform since IPO, but we've expanded that. We've now got a big B2B development drive where we're getting a lot of referrals. Um, we've signed up Flight Centre who refer us their staff. We've just done a deal with the agency, the listed um, a real estate group to refer us work. Uh, and we're doing a lot more on in that space uh, uh, to secure non-digital work to round out um, the referral partnership. As our brand goes, we're getting more recognition and more people are coming to us. And we've opened additional service lines that you can see there. We, we launched the Faculty of Arbitration and Mediation the week before the Family Court announced that they were outsourcing to arbitration and mediation 7,000 cases. So we can work nimbly and quickly to meet the markets and the demands. Uh, the growth rates, well, I'll let you have a look at those. Um, our revenue um, up to our pro formers that I'll speak about for, for this year and our underlying EBIT shows the compound annual growth rates. Um, the investments highlights, again, I come back to the fact that we've achieved all this with less than um, you know, one to 2% market share. Um, you know, we've demonstrated our model. We've undertaken some key acquisitions and we're now getting brand cadence in the market. No one knew of us five years ago because we started on the kitchen table of the founder, but now we're the talk in the market because what we're doing and the people uh, and the acquisitions and our model and what it's achieved. Um, I mentioned that we're the finalist in the Australian Law Awards. Um, it's easy to sort of say we make money and we grow, but you've got to have great lawyers. Um, we have the largest number of accredited specialists, the largest number of lawyers who are undertaking masters or accredited specialization. The firms that we've bought have produced four judges. There's judicial registrars that work for us. 
uh, it's best in class. We have a chief legal officer, the best, best um, level of precedence. And Professor Patrick Parkinson, who was the Dean of the Faculty of Law, is our professor in residence. So we perform our product and service um, to, to the highest level. Okay, in terms of the results, um, well, I think uh, the acquisitions have spoken about, I'll talk to the numbers because there's been some questions ahead of the game there. Um, lateral highs, I think our growth in terms of you know, leads, paid and organic has grown um, massively over the period. And we've invested a lot of our cash into growing our market share and growing our presence in that space. Um, and look, the, the bottom line in terms of growth that I'll talk to as well is that we've got a good pipeline to continue our trajectory. Our benchmark internally is 30% growth per annum, um, and I don't see any impediment for us continuing on that, that pathway. Uh, so in terms of the profit and loss for last year, um, you can see the revenue. Now we report um, on sort of three levels, our operating EBIT, underlying EBIT and statutory levels. So our operating EBIT effectively addresses that, that we have our corporate overhead for being listed um, and that sits at about 1.2 million and has since we've been listed. One of the questions was why do we include that in there? Well, we've done it because as we started, we were a 12 million market cap. We were turning over about $6 million um, to include a 1.2 million uh, in the numbers obviously distorts the flow of the business from where it was to where it's going. So we've excluded that to show a growth trajectory uh, of a family law firm in a comparative market and what we achieve over others. Um, the underlying EBIT at 2.674 million is a significant difference between the EBIT at a statutory level of 771. So there's a lot of questions around where does that delta and what makes that up? So there's really three differences in there that we've excluded from our underlying EBIT, um, which is what we have done before, really the non-reoccurring expenses. But the, the difference really falls into three buckets. The first is the share-based payments. So there's about $750,000 that are paid to um, the executives and staff. We have an employee performance rights scheme for the staff. We're the first uh, listed law firm to do that um, uh, within our first year of listing. Some of the other firms have taken seven or eight years and some don't even have it. So uh, this year we've given out performance rights to our key players on success. And look, the executive salaries are, are modest comparatively. So the alignment of the rewards around shares also aligns with the shares that the investors have. So that you know, if we can, can grow the value of them uh, as employees and executives, then we can grow the shareholders' value. So there's 750,000 in performance rights or, or share-based payments. The second bucket is um, $500,000 in non-reoccurring expenses. And these principally relate to the acquisitions that we've molded into our business. Um, we're currently undergoing a transition of Watts McRae. There's leases, um, uh, of premises that will be reduced, savings made there, the licenses, the software, they've got 15 photocopiers, they only need one. Um, there's some staff calibration levels. So all those non-reoccurring expenses have come out. And the last bucket is about $600,000 that relate to the costs that we've had to include in our financials at a statutory level that relate to the costs of these acquisitions running on a private, as a private business. So a lot of the owners have their cars, um, office, home office expenses, uh, their accounting fees, the key man insurance, et cetera, in, in their businesses that they've expensed. And we've had to include those in our underlying EBIT as well um, at a statutory, uh, sorry, we, we've taken those out of our underlying EBIT, but that's what drives the statutory EBIT. Uh, so they're the sort of three differences other than the share-based payments, none of those will reoccur in the next year. Um, there's been some questions about the expenses in the 4E around our increase in marketing. Will that continue? Yes, it will. Um, we're here to grab market share. We're gaining ascendancy. We're flexing our muscles. We'll continue to invest in that. Um, and there was a question around our software expenses. Uh, that had doubled, but that's effectively because the size of the business has doubled. Um, our balance sheet is very strong. Um, can I say there's a couple of things about that I'll just mention very quickly. 
Uh, our cash um, sitting behind this is $1.8 million of money in trust. Um, that doesn't appear on our balance sheet, but that can be converted within 14 days of us issuing bills. Um, we don't carry much WIP. We bill it every 14 days or even sooner if the bill hits a certain level. The money is all underwritten by uh, uh, funds that are placed into trust by the clients. So our ability to convert fees to cash is a two week period um, in, in that respect. So we're not like the listed law firms that carry these large WIP balances that can go awry across the two year life of a matter. So our balance sheet is strong. We have no debt. Um, our capital raise was successful. And over the course of the year, we spent two and a half million dollars, including costs on acquisitions. So um, what does the future hold for us? Um, so we've achieved everything we said we were going to do to date. Um, you know, we want to continue to grow the business at 30% plus. Um, we certainly have built a strong pipeline of acquisitions that we're, we're, we will consider in our journey. Um, there are 25 jurisdictions that we can open a family law office in um, uh, that we're looking at. Our, um, our desire to secure a 10% market share is imminently achievable in the next three years. Um, our desire is to get this to a $50 million revenue and a $10 million EBIT, and um, we're certainly on a, a path to do that. And across that journey, we're seeing some interest in other area of add-on services to family law in the, in the private client services space that sort of range anything from funding solutions to, um, to wills and estates. In fact, we're having some conversations with the buy now, pay later providers that are, are, are tailoring a solution for us in the family law space. Uh, so that's pretty much a summary of where we are. Thanks, Mark, and thanks to the investors. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, um, just conscious of the time as well. I try yeah. to answer some of those on the journey, Mark. So yeah, I hope I yeah do thanks, um, Grant. That's greatly appreciated those ones that are emailed in ahead of time. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to make it um, through them all. Marketing was a question that was ahead of time, and there's a good one here. Um, how do you budget for marketing? Do you, do you see it as a function as a percentage of revenue or what way do you think about it? Yeah, look, we do. So we work on a range of about 8% 8, 8 of revenue and then we structure a marketing plan with our chief marketing officer who's ex-Shine and our marketing uh, advisory board. Uh, and then we stagger it out across months with various spends in digital business development We've just started above the line advertising, which you'll see more. We've started to appear on radio in some jurisdictions now. Um, so it's a, a well thought out, laid out plan, which is flexible in that if things aren't working, for instance, if things slow down in COVID, you can shift that spend to another jurisdiction, which is more, which you can see digitally is performing better. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a fluid exercise, but well structured, set, planned and budgeted. Okay, great. And then uh, let's tackle this one. Um, the founder, Edward Finn, is leaving the board. Um, yep. you know, what's going to be his involvement with the company going forward? Yeah, sure. So Ed's, Ed's going to remain a major shareholder. Um, he uh, has stepped out of the company to run a private equity business, which is what he was always um, wanting to do. Um, if you ask Ed, and everyone's welcome to contact him if they want, he'll tell you he wasn't a lawyer to start with. He was an entrepreneur who had marvellous nous in the digital space. Um, you know, you reach a point where you bring in some consultants and governance in the digital, which is global. I think Ed sort of realised that he'd done all that he could do. And, and um, you know, certainly he's seen the growth of his um, shares in the price and feels very comfortable now that that he can leave it aside to the management who are used to running these businesses and have had have done so well since listing a couple of years ago. Uh, Grant and Cognizant, we're just pushing up on time. Have you got five minutes to try and tackle a few more of these? Or do you Absolutely. Yeah, Mark, by all means. Okay, great. Um, the lateral hires, this is a good question. Uh, presumably these lawyers are not running their own practices. Uh, are they moving from another practice? You know, what clients are they bringing if family law, family law matters are generally not recurring? Yeah, okay. So good question. So they, they do not do not run their own businesses. They're normally in a business where there's a glass ceiling and they can't get to partnership. 
they might also be in a broader practice business where there's other forms of law done and, and family law is the poorer cousin. So um, for, for just the nature of the law. Um, and they're looking for to work in a, a pure family law firm that's got the family law support around them. So um, they come across, they normally bring um, between two hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in revenue and clients. Uh, it's hard when you act for a family law client um, to, to stop them from not following you. You can stop stop them you from working for them, but they tend to follow you. Um, and they come across to us because we, we match their salaries, we give them short-term incentives, we give them performance rights, we give them autonomy, and then they work in you know, a, a successfully culture-based growing family law firm that's best in the market. So you know, we've got an offering out there that's unique um, and you know, they've come across happily and everyone that's come across now has performance rights and is going well within the business. Um, yeah, maybe a follow-on question to, to that. Um, how does AFL avoid the difficulties with the, the public model? Partners get less equity in the firm. They need to share the equity with us as shareholders. Doesn't this disincentivize top talent from joining the firm if they could get more equity by taking the work connections, expertise, etc. cetera, um, elsewhere? And then HWL's Edward's decision to pull their... IPO, do you think that was related to the, the kind of the, the public model versus having your own private practice model? Yeah, look, I, I think a couple of things to be said about that is that um, the broader commercial firms are not unique. They're not niche. They're not specialized. They do lots of different types of law and there's lots of those out there. So um, I think they're a harder model to float. On the partnership side, it's, 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 it's an interesting question because in a lot of respects, it sort of centers back to the nature of family law and diversity or gender balance. So 90% of our lawyers are, are women. Um, they've never really had the desire to own businesses. Um, their focus is more on having careers, having children, having families and having balance. So that sort of, you know, um, male historical dominated you know, I, I want to own, I want to make millions doesn't sort of permeate through the culture of family law. So we don't get, we don't get that, um, you know, people leave us because they want to own their own business. They're actually coming to us because we can accommodate all of their needs, but it's very much driven by the fact that predominantly they're women. Women are, tend to be better at family law because they're, they're, they're more empathetic um, and they're more considerate. Um, and I, I say that with respect to the men in the audience, but, you know, when you're dealing with all sort of forms of situation that relate to women, kids, men, um, you know, abuse, etc., it's a very hard world and women tend to do it better. So it's, it's, it's very much unique to family law. And, um, you know, when, with us giving them performance rights, it, we actually give them equity that they would not, not otherwise have had. And, and we're seeing that that's sort of motivating them as well. But they're, they're the, the fundamental differences in my observations, having been in, you know, several listed law firms. Okay, great. And then maybe one from me, I know on your map that you had at the start, um, you know, you've pretty much ticked off all the capital cities. I think Hobart and Darwin were missing um, yep. at this stage. In terms of like, Brent, is the plan to, you know, fill out in, in all of the capital cities or is regional Australia, you know, part of it. I'm just thinking, you know, some of the bigger places, you know, like, you know, Bendigo or Orange or Tweed Heads or Townsville, you know, I, I can't imagine there's too many family law practices and they must be running like little mini local monopolies, but maybe not very tech or tech savvy ones. I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, what the strategy yeah. is there. Yeah, so look, we've identified about 25 regions where we can open an office or secure a lateral hire. Um, what underpins a family law firm is the population base. So you need between 80 to 100,000 people. Um, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go regional. So, you know, you can see across this trajectory of our growth, we've opened offices on the Gold Coast. Um, so that's, a, that's not a, a full base. We don't have anyone in that office, but we opened it. 600,000 people down there, we will bring in a lateral high, but we could see massive digital take up on the coast. So we put our toe in the water down there. Metropolitan Melbourne North, you know, there's 400,000 people in the north of Melbourne. 
um, there is only one serious family law player. So we've opened a beachhead there. We know that people won't travel more than 15 kilometres. We bought in a lateral hire. Um, she works that office well. Um, so so you, can, you can grow across the existing capitals. You know, it's like a hub and spoke CBD office, north, south, east and west. And you'll see us emerge in that space um, with some, some news around um, our next sort of growth in that, that sort of vein. And then there's a whole series of other areas just like the cities that you've mentioned, you know, Wollongong, Newcastle's the fourth largest city down the East Coast. They're all in our gun sites. They're all, um, there's conversations taking place as we build it. Now we don't rush to these places just so we have to, we can open an office. Um, you know, there's sustainability around what, what we want to achieve and it's very much people-based and cultural-based. So we do take time and we do reject a lot too. Um, we reject a lot because we don't feel that the people are right. We don't feel that the brands have got the, the, the equity that they need. And we don't feel that the markets are right for us um, at a particular time. And we do a lot of analytics and diagnostics around that. Uh, a question um, on WIP. Um, what is the nature of WIP in this business? Uh, and, and why do you have it? Yeah, so our WIP is different to the personal injuries firms is that we're fee for service. So when a client comes in, we ask for money and trust. We secure a retainer at hourly rates. And then we start working on that, which is the WIP. And then when the WIP hits a particular level or a time, which is either two weeks or $5,000, it gets billed immediately. So we don't carry much WIP. We convert the whip to fees, the fees that sit in the trust, and then it, and it converts to cash. Um, look, it's not a perfect business. There will be some overlay where there aren't fees that cover the work because sometimes you're in the middle of a custody battle and you might do some more work. And sometimes that leads to a debtor's situation. But we run a massively tight debtor's um, policy and position and um, we're able to convert the cash to whip. And, that's, that's what a lot of investors think, oh, look, you know, we've seen Shine struggle with their whip um, amendments and write downs. Um, we don't have that situation. We get paid win, lose or draw. They get paid only if they win. We get paid within a week to two weeks. They get paid every two and a half years when the case is over. Um, they have to fund their disbursements. The clients fund our disbursements. It's all a self-funding model and a cash converting model. Um, okay, I think we'll uh, leave it there. I'm conscious we're, we're on nearly 10 minutes over time. Apologies Sorry. to anyone whose questions I didn't get to, but uh, Grant, just before you jump off, maybe just go back to the final slide there with the contact details. And if anybody... We didn't get to your question. They can, sorry, go back. Yeah, they can. They can maybe um, shoot them through to you directly. Yeah, look, absolutely. I'm, I speak to all the investors uh, that, that contact me, and I'm happy to take any calls. And uh, look, we're in an exciting space. We've had some investors that have come in early and followed us on the journey. Um, they're, they're they're with us. They've reaped the benefits. We'd certainly welcome. Uh, everyone onto the registrar. We're, we're set for our next stage of growth. We're gaining ascendancy. Uh, we've got the capital backing um, and we've got uh, heady sites. So thanks to all the investors and thanks to you, Mark. Grant, thank you very much. I know this one has been a long time in the planning, so it was great to get you on <laughs> heard the story first time. Indeed. Cheers, Mark. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of your Thursday.